um, as an instructional specialist. I'm glad you guys could make it for our um, webinar today, Community Connections. Today we have with us Renee Damon. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes, you did. Renee Damon from Oklahoma, okay. from Oklahoma Autism Network. We also have from the State Department, Susan Bows, who is also a program specialist. And then we have Kristen Perez Rickles, who is, um, she works on our um, state um, professional development grant. She's on our SPADIG team. So um, that, that is um, where we stand. And thanks everybody for, for joining us this afternoon. Okay, um, Susan, did you want to introduce, give Renee's background or would you like for me I to sure do that? Sure can, I can do that. <laughs> so Renee is the director <laughs> of the Oklahoma Autism Network in the Lee Michener uh, Tolbert Center for Developmental Disabilities and Autism. She is a physical therapist and a board certified behavior analyst. Renee has worked with families and their children with disabilities, including autism since 1993. She was the co-principal investigator for the Connected Kids program, a parent training program for parents of young children with autism. Renee chairs the Oklahoma Family and Interagency Autism Council, serves on the Developmental Disability Services Advisory Committee for the Oklahoma Department of Human Services, and is a member of the Oklahoma Transition Council. She was a member of the Governor's Blue Ribbon Panel for Developmental Disabilities under Governor Fallon. And all of you, please welcome with me, Renee. Thanks. It's good to be here. It's, this is a great way, as we were talking about, to share information with schools and others around the state. So it's neat that you guys are doing this. Well, thank, thanks for joining us. Um, a lot of times, I know people know about the different advocacy groups that we have here in Oklahoma, but are not real familiar with exactly what you do. So I'm glad you you uh, were able to join us today. Sure. C can you tell us a little bit about your organization? Sure. Um, so the Oklahoma Autism Network, we started in 2003. We um, started I mean, it seems like a really long time ago now, but back in around 1999, 2000, there were a group of stakeholders who came together to look at where services were in Oklahoma for individuals with autism. The prevalence of autism wasn't as high as it is today, but it was growing. And um, I think one of the huge differences between now and then is that at that time, you literally had a small group of people who were really focused on autism services in Oklahoma. So that group met for a couple of years and developed um, what's called the Individuals with Autism and Their Families Oklahoma Plan. And in that plan, they identified an administrative unit that would be a unit that would not oversee all the services with autism or for children with autism or individuals with autism in Oklahoma, but that would kind of be an entity to bring people together to really look at how we keep moving forward. And um, so that the Oklahoma Autism Network was identified as that entity. That, that's how we started. Um, DHS can, came to our chair of our program and um, asked if we would start the network. So it started as two days a week of my job back in 2003. Um, we have been around since that time and have done a lot of different things over the course of the last, what, 17, almost 18 years now. The state, for those of you who've been involved in special ed or just in education and, and working with people with disabilities um, in Oklahoma, there's been a lot that's changed in that time with a lot more, a lot more stakeholders at the table, a lot more people involved um, specifically for serving individuals with autism as the prevalence has increased. Um, so that's, that's how we started. We're housed at the OU Health Sciences Center in the College of Allied Health. Um, and we do a wide range of things, which I think is one of the next questions. So I won't just jump right ahead, but, um, oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we do, um, we, we, you know, have the autism council. We've continued to kind of shepherd the statewide plan, um, as things have evolved and grown over the years and have been involved in 
lots of things from training and technical assistance to advocacy to assisting with legislation to um, the Connected Kids program, which was a, a research study mandated by the legislature back in 2009. So it's we've done a lot of different things and coordinated the um, Oklahoma Statewide Autism Conference, which we have our 12th okay. conference coming up in February. So nice. Okay, can you um, tell us what preserve what services you provide to families? Well, so um, more specifically thinking about families, we, we are the state resource and referral specifically for autism. So we do have a lot of families who contact us seeking everything from a very specific service for their child, whether that's a diagnostic evaluation or a different type of service. Um, we have adults contact us seeking sometimes diagnostic evaluations and services and supports. Um, so we, we connect people with resources in their community we provide parent training um, and technical assistance <laughs> um, and uh, have also provided services to families over the years through things like our Connected Kids program, which is um, a, a specific program where we teach parents to use um, ABA strategies in the context of daily routines and play with their child. So, um, and then all the, all the trainings like and things are available to families um, who, who want to participate in that. And at some point, okay. we're going through this, I can show you um, some different things on our website that are okay. So. Okay. Um, and what services do you provide specifically to schools? Well, we um, currently do not provide a lot of services directly to schools. We, over the years, we, um, for about five years, we had some funding through the State Department of Education where we provided more targeted services to schools. We've done um, training and professional development for schools over the years. Right now we do have a, um, a contract where we consult in a, one school district and provide direct services and supports to teachers in that district that support students with autism in their programs. Um, but things like our trainings and professional development that we do, the conference, um, those things are available. And we have a lot of educators who attend and participate in, in the conference and the other trainings that we, we have. Um, so that's the primary support right now that we provide right. to schools. Do you ever have schools contacting you just specifically for, a, for um, professional development? That, yes, that you're not we, have over, with. We, we have over the years um, done that, you know, when some of the legislation passed that required um, all general educators, like right. it, kindergarten through third grade to have training um, every three right. years, I think it is. Um, we've done every three years. Uh -huh. Yeah, we've done some of that over the years. We've also provided some very specific, like training to school districts that have contacted us specifically. Um, Currently, we, we don't have um, kind of the bandwidth to do that on a very large scale. Um, so a lot of times what we do is, is to connect them with another resource um, in order to do that, or sometimes connect schools. Sometimes schools contact us seeking like a, an FBA, you know, somebody who can come out and conduct a functional behavior assessment or provide support to them if they right. have a student with significant needs, especially around challenging behavior. Right. So. Right. Um, since you mentioned that, from your experience, what do you see that Oklahoma public schools are doing well? Well, that's like a big, broad question, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that the things that I have, and, and again, there it's variable just in the sense that, I mean, as any of you know, and especially at the State Department of Ed, you know, we've got, what, 500 and some odd school districts. Right. Some are large, some are quite small. Um, in general terms, I think the things that I see that have improved a lot and, and that we're doing better with in Oklahoma is um, recognizing students across the spectrum. Um, so recognizing students even with milder characteristics of autism mm -hmm. and, and learning more about how to support children across the spectrum. Um, in educational settings. 
I think that we, as a whole, um, when I think back to when I, I first started working in the schools in the 90s, that I think we, we are better at creating opportunities for students with autism to be included in general education as much as as they are able, or, you know, it, that's different for each child, but I think we are on the better at that. Um, I think that we also are a little, we're better, we've, we've had a lot of training and professional development from other entities around um, certain schools having diagnostic and evaluation teams. So at evaluating within the schools, again, that can be variable from site to site. Um, mm -hmm. Those are probably, I don't know, the big things I think of that we're Show an improvement in. Yeah, you know, people and, and I think aware. too, in some cases, learning how to manage challenging behavior, I think that's also one of the areas where we still have a long room to grow, but. Right. And um, Kristen Perez Rickles, that's what she focuses. And also Susan um, also focus on the behavior side of that. So I'm sure, and they've done a lot of training and and on that too with, with schools. So I think the more word that gets out about mm -hmm. the Oklahoma Autism Network and what you provide and what of course the State Department provides when it comes to challenging behaviors, um, it, it will keep improving. Uh, yeah, you know? I agree, I agree. Yeah. Um, do you, how do you think your organization can assist schools in making improvements? just with probably what you've already said about your professional development and conferences? I think pr that's primarily, yes, I think that's primarily the way we help. I think, um, you know, obviously we work in one specific district where we do a lot more intensive support, but I think on a global scale, the conference, um, we've brought in a lot of really great national and local speakers over the last 11 years, really bringing yeah. them evidence-based information and then um, through resources and things on our website we've been able to you know make that information available to people right. um, do you want to go ahead and share your screen and kind of show us around your website yeah I'm happy to do that okay Can you see that okay? Kind of uh -huh, we can. Um, so this, this is the landing page on our website and I'm just gonna focus on a few areas that I think are specifically um, really helpful for families and professionals. And I think a great resource that teachers can point some of their families to as well, because I, a lot of the teachers I work with are often asking for resources that they can provide to their families to help them um, so when you get to the to the home page, um, one of the main places I think is, is helpful to point families is when you hover over this information and resources section of our website. Um, one of the places we point people a lot when they contact us is the provide a, find a provider or resource. We have a uh, resource directory that we're constantly updating. The people that you find or the resources that you find on this section of our website are people who have completed a provider form and submitted that to us. So this isn't an exhaustive list of the, the providers that are out there in Oklahoma, but um, it's, it's those we've reached out to to fill out a form or they've reached out to us and, and completed a form. And this is a great way for uh, families and professionals to be able to find resources to link uh, people to in their area. Um, one of the things that has always been an issue in Oklahoma and continues to be, even though it's getting better, is families who live in rural areas being able to find providers outside of the schools, which I think is one of the reasons families in rural areas depend so heavily on the school, because that's usually their only link to sources of um, right. for their child with a disability. But this is a great place to help families connect um, or for professionals to connect with a resource that they might need. A new section of our website that we added, um, we actually had had this process in the works, but then the early months of COVID gave us the opportunity to really heavily focus on writing and creating this section of our website. Um, this is a section of the website 
called Navigating Autism, where we've broken it down into six areas that over the years, our experience working with families and professionals, we felt like this was a, a, a logical way to break up the information and, and make it easy for people to access. Um, and in here, under each section, we have information um, presented in a variety of ways. So we have webinars that we've conducted over the last um, year that we have recorded and posted. So people can go oh, out nice. and watch the webinar. Um, and then one of the things we've done with each of the webinars is we've created a little worksheet where people can take notes here, but it also asks questions to help people think about um, how to apply the information that they're learning through the webinar. Um, so, let me go back to, so, um, you know, we have this section under, you know, just understanding autism, um, accessing services and supports to help people. We've got some tools to really help, like a teacher could use this um, or a family mm -hmm. on their own. You know, looking at using an eco map process to really identify where the gaps are in services that a family might have. Um, some tools to help families think about things and professionals, again, can can benefit from reading through this to help give them some ideas on how to support a family in making making decisions about things that they might services they might be accessing for their child. Um, right. Just like a good refresher for families, too. Yeah. And then we have little toolkits like going out in the community because that's something families struggle with. So it's a nice, you know, little toolkit that you can download and print that um, helps the family kind of think about, you know, things to think about, questions to think about when you're planning going out, identifying ways to prepare, you know, what expectations you have for your child, um, those types of things. So, um, this section of our website, we are continuing to add to and um, grow this section. Um, but it's a great place for different tools. The other thing that uh, teachers and things might find helpful is we're creating and we still have some stuff we're adding here. We have a challenging behavior webinar. Um, we are creating tools around um, a research article called the big four because that research article um, really talks about four critical skill areas that all children with autism need that we should actually start working on when they are young um, i say if you want to read this article you could you could come up with iep goals for the course of a child's educational career um oh, nice and and so we're creating toolkits around things like developing coping skills. And then we've got these three other toolkits that we're, that we're working on. Um, so that's a great section for people to go to. We also um, have a, a new section that we added uh, the last couple of months on transition to adulthood. I think one of your questions on here is where could we continue to be improving our services? I think this uh -huh. is really one of those areas um, I don't think that's, Transition. yeah, I don't think that's unique to autism. I think that's, um, probably for all disability categories, but, right. you know, right. really intentionally supporting these students, um, in transition. So we have a webinar on here. We have resource tools around that. Um, and then the trainings and events we have, um, some of our webinars connected through here. So like we did a What Works webinar series, um, a four part series early. Um, some of that's not loading, right? Or wait, no, there it is. It's, it's, that was a partnering with parents. I clicked on the wrong one. The What the <laughs> webinar series um, has some great strategies and, and tools as well. And then um, that's, our great tool, uh... that's coming up, so. Um, those are probably the main things on here. And then we've added a Spanish section where we're trying to slowly grow that section as well. So um, Very nice. Yeah, we're just we've we've talked about this for a really long time and we had the plan in place to try and put tools out there because so often what what I've found over the years is only so many people, even when we were able to do in-person trainings, right? <laughs> 
only so many people can actually get to a training. You know, they the only right. so many people can take off work or only so many families that live like close to your geographic area can actually come to a training. So how can we get right. useful tools and information to people regardless of where they live? In right. I bet those videos are really nice. And the webinars are very informative. Yeah, so. So that's great. Do any, do any of our participants have any questions for Renee? Renee, I just have a really quick question about the autism conference. I know that um, you guys have scholarships available for families. Do you have mm -hmm. any recommendations for professionals trying to connect their families to the conference and help them get in to the conference? Sure. I mean, um, I think you can, if you um, wanted to just point families to our website, there is a um, drop down. I can show you where it is because we have a limited number of scholarships that we haven't received very many applications so far. So we should still have um, several scholarships available. If you just scroll down to the family scholarship application, can you all see that? Families. It's, a little, it's a little bit blurry. It's, it's on, but it's a little blurry. Hmm. Okay. Wonder if I forgot to tap. Well, you see the technology, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, it's probably you. Um, if you go to the conference section of the website and you click on the family scholarship application tab, there is an actual application that you can download. Um, people could print that off and send it home with their family. I mean, probably with a little note so that it wasn't confusing, but um, right. we oh. waive the registration for the families that receive the scholarship. Um, oh, thank you, Kristen. And then educators, Project 613 funds are available to support educators in, in attending as well um, through support from you all at the State Department of Ed. Um, so yeah, I think just pointing them to the website and um, it's gonna be virtual for our first time ever. Um, we did have a big event in October with Dr. Carter, who's one of our keynote speakers again. Um, and it went, it went really well. So we're, we're excited to be able to bring these two speakers and they really both have this just amazing way of panning out and thinking about things in, in such a broad, big way that it can really kind of be a paradigm shift for all of us, I think, when we, when we listen to them. So I have one more question about the conference. I'm so sorry. How, okay. how, how are the, the sessions organized? Is there like a strand for family members and a strand for educators? Or is there a lot of um, intermixing and the sessions are designed for both uh, audience types? Well, this year is more simplistic than any conference we've ever had. Because um, normally anybody who's attended our conference in the past, you know, we have between... 20 to 30 speakers and multiple breakouts at a time. But because of this format, what we decided we only have, everybody will be in the same session together um, both mornings. So we will all be together hearing the same message. And um, I can go and I'm not screen sharing anymore, am I? I don't think. Um, oh, you're Well, so like, Dr. Carter is going to talk about a future of flourishing, the postures, practices, and people that can change trajectories. And so that both of their topics are relevant to professionals and family members. Um, and then Saturday morning, Dr. Shala Alai, she's faculty at University of North Texas. She's going to be talking about nurturing contingencies of joy. Um, so it is just everybody will be together, both both days. So there's not tracks per se. Okay. Um, and, and I don't remember this if you've already said it and you can just register for your conference through your, through your website. 
Yes, if you just go to, um, here, I'll screen share again so I can show you. If you go to the conference tab on our website mm -hmm. and you just scroll down, um, you can see everything from the agenda, which is what I, you can, where you can read the descriptions and the objectives for mm -hmm. each sessions. Um, but then if you want to register, if you just click here on registration, okay. it, it lists the cost. It talks about how to register. People can send a form and a check. They can go to our marketplace site and do it by credit card. As I said, there are project 613 funds available. Um, and then for a family member, they can go to the family and scholarship application and register that way. They can complete the application. Those are due February 5th. So that timeline is quickly approaching, um, but that's that's the ways that they can register. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Are there any other questions? Has anyone sent family members to, um, or referred family members to the Oklahoma Autism Network before? I know that I did, um, and I know families found it very useful, especially the resource section. Um, I have families who participated in a support group out of a church in Norman, um, and I had some that moved and were able to find some resources in a different part of the state, too, because of y'all's website. So I really appreciated that as an educator. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Do you have any other final thoughts on, you know, must have information for teachers in the state? Well, I mean, I think, I think the biggest thing is um, there's so much to know as a teacher. I mean, I think <laughs> I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know already, but I think especially, like I said, when, if a family's not connected to any other system of support, um, they look to the teacher, their child's teacher as like their kind of connection to the world, you know, for, for the things that their child might need. So I think, you know, the biggest thing is just knowing that, that we're out here and um, that other disability resources are out here so that you can, because sometimes I think, you know, you guys don't have to know the answer to every single thing. I mean, it's impossible, I think, for any one of us to know the answer to everything that's out there. So just knowing that we're out here to help you, to help support some of your families, um, you can refer them to us and, you know, we'll help them navigate the service systems as best we can to connect to those resources um, outside of what their child might be getting at school. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. Cause I, and I think, you know, it, it can vary. It might be that they're seeking a private service. It might be that, you know, they're needing additional supports at home, um, whatever it might be. I think sometimes we can, we can walk them through some things because I know a lot of times educators, at least it's been my experience, are hesitant sometimes to talk about too many things because they, there's always, I think, a little bit of a fear that, oh, if I say something about that or recommend that, then is the school responsible? Um, so sometimes pointing them to us, we can help them navigate through those things without, you know, that concern, so. It's all about building that network for families, right? Absolutely, yeah, helping the families know how to, how to navigate and access what their child needs. Okay, Renee, thank you so much. If there aren't any other questions, I guess, um, unless you have some more information to share with us, but um, I think we've kind of gone over everything that we were that we were planning to. Okay. Um, thank you so much, and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. We I would encourage it. everyone following this um, webinar to go and look at all of those resources and the webinars that are on the um, Oklahoma Autism Network's website. I'm really excited for those big four toolkits to come out. I think that'll be a really great resource. So thank you, Renee. Yeah, the only other thing I was gonna say that I forgot is people can also email us or they can have families email us. 
One of the other things that I forgot to share that we did was early on during COVID, we, I was really proud of us. We put out a newsletter a week from March until I think like October. Um, and on, the, it, that's just one more thing, if that's okay, I'll quick, quickly, quickly share is um, go to uh, our COVID-19 resources. Um, these newsletters are all out here and we have everything from, we had little articles about tools and ideas, building coping skills, um, taking care of yourself as a parent, just different things like that. Parents oh, wow. and professionals can sign up for our newsletter um, if you just want to email us. And that way, when we have new webinars coming up or anything like that, you'll get notified about it. Um, we're working on a series for this year. And so when that comes out, you'll, you'll know and can register. Um, so just one more thing. I am putting in the chat before. Oh, her email in the chat box. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I guess we're, we're done for today, unless there's any last minute questions.